with this per a tweet from International Boxing News. Commonwealth title next for Dubois. Carolyn Dubois, who was in action this weekend, advanced to a professional record of six wins, no losses, and no draws with five knockouts, has expressed an interest in fighting Rhiannon Dixon for the Commonwealth title, providing she wins it on March 11th. For those not already aware, Rhiannon Dixon will be returning to action opposite the ring unbeaten Vicky Wilkinson. The vacant Commonwealth title will be on the line. Both Carolyn and Rhiannon on campaign in the women's lightweight division. Lightweight, that's where Katie Taylor reigns as that division's undisputed champion. Needless to say, these unbeaten up-and-comers are a ways out from a Katie Taylor fight, but they're not a ways out from a fight with each other. The question is, will this fight materialize? It being that Carolyn Dubois... She's on the Sky Sports and Boxer side of things. Whereas Rhiannon Dixon fights on DAZN under the Matchroom banner. She's going to be fighting on the undercard of Smith versus Stipian. Will this upcoming battle of the unbeatens in March lead to a battle of the unbeatens, the unbeaten southpaws, Rhiannon Dixon and Carolyn Dubois. Will this fight lead to that fight? And I'm afraid to say I don't think it will. I don't think so. I don't think one battle of the unbeatens will necessarily lead to the other. I understand that, at least in theory, it is possible for a matchroom fighter to cross over to Sky Sports and Boxer to take on one of their fighters. I mean, that's what we saw in the Alicia Baumgartner versus Michaela Mayer fight. But there was an incentive to do that. There was an incentive for Alicia to cross over to Sky Sports and Boxer, a financial incentive. They offered Alicia a lot of money. And Michaela Mayer's two titles, the two titles she held at that time. Don't forget it was a grudge match. But while it is possible for a matchroom fighter to cross over to Boxer for a fight, there has to be an incentive. There has to be a reason to do it. Financial incentive? Well, in a scenario where Rhiannon Dixon procures the Commonwealth title, shouldn't it be Carolyn Dubois crossing over? In theory, it should. She's the one that wants the opportunity. She's the one that would want, in that scenario, what Rhiannon Dixon has got. But there are a lot of questions. What would the people at Boxer have to offer Rhiannon Dixon a crossover to their side of things to give their fighter an opportunity? What dollar amount would it take? And what dollar amount would it take to get Carolyn and Dubois to cross over to Matchroom. Is that even a fight that Matchroom wants to make? A fight they want Rhiannon Dixon to take, is it? Let's not pretend that Carolyn Dubois and Rhiannon Dixon come from the same kind of deep amateur background because they don't. Carolyn Dubois is an Olympian, whereas Rhiannon Dixon, she don't come from that. She doesn't come from the same kind of deep amateur background as Carolyn Dubois. For the most part, Rhiannon Dixon, who I have a high opinion of, she's learning on the job. Not all unbeaten up and comers are created equal. Not all unbeaten up and comers come from the same kind of background. I don't know that the Dixon people would want a fight like that after the Wilkinson fight, provided that they wouldn't tell. I don't even know how long they're going to hang on to the Commonwealth title. For all I know, they'll drop it. Rhiannon Dixon might win that title in March and drop it immediately after. Set her sights on some lesser version of an alphabet title. It's what I see a lot of fighters do when it comes to the Commonwealth title. They drop it, then maybe they shoot for the EBU. EBU title. The title that binds here is the Commonwealth title. That's what Carolyn Dubois seems to be interested in. She's interested in taking on the winner of Dixon versus Wilkinson for it. What if the winner drops it? Then what? I want to say that I'm very high on the both of these fighters, both Rhiannon Dixon and Carolyn Dubois, respectively. But Carolyn Dubois, to somebody like Rhiannon Dixon, she's a high-risk, low-reward opponent. That's what she is. Rhiannon Dixon people would look at a fight like that and likely ask themselves, what's in it for us? Why should we make this fight? Do we really need to take on a fight like this so early in Rhiannon's career? Without condoning or condemning, that's what I think the hierarchy of thought would be. Tack on that they're on competing platforms, fighting under competing banners, political boundary lines that separate these fighters and fragment the sport. What would it take? What would the people at Boxer have to pay Rhiannon Dixon to bring her over for such a fight? And would they be willing to pay? And ask those same questions about Carolyn. Carolyn crossing over to Matchroom. In truth, if they were to by some chance make the fight, I think you would have to give Carolyn Dubois the edge. Rhiannon Dixon is fast, but so is Carolyn Dubois. But Carolyn's a bigger punch 
adventure than Rhiannon, by far and wide. The way she's plowing through these girls, mowing them down. It's a high-risk, low-reward fight. And what's the reward for taking on somebody like that? What's the point? Just being honest with you. I like the idea of the fight. It is an intriguing fight. Carolyn Dubois would get the edge, but ultimately, I don't actually think the fight sees the light of day. I don't think it materializes beyond the Wilkinson fight that Rhiannon Dixon is about to have. I don't think Dixon versus Dubois is next. I'd sooner expect Rhiannon Dixon to drop that Commonwealth title and shoot for another kind of belt. It's just being honest. I don't think the fight happens. Maybe Rhiannon Dixon and Carolyn Dubois will square off against each other sometime down the line, but I don't think it happens in the immediate future. I don't. In men's heavyweight news, the ongoing situation for what's supposed to be the undisputed title fight between champions Tyson Fury and Oleksandr Yusik per IFL TV, Tyson Fury versus Oleksandr Yusik is now set to take place at Wembley on April 29th with Saudi officials unable to confirm that Jetta Stadium will be built in time for the proposed date. So we're to believe that the Saudis couldn't deliver on a deadline. And that's why the fight is in jeopardy. That's why the fight is ending up at Wembley Stadium. Tyson Fury's neck of the woods, where reportedly he always wanted the fight to land. He always wanted it to be there. That's his preference. That's not a neutral location. At Wembley, Tyson Fury will have home field advantage. And the story now is, per boxing scribe Sean Nam, Usyk's promoter Alexander Krasiuk tells me, as long as he's representing Usyk, he won't budge from a 50-50 split for the Fury fight. Says it's more than fair. Krasiuk flies to London tomorrow to hammer out a deal with George Warren. Says he's really optimistic. We'll see. We're supposed to believe that growing concerns over the construction of the stadium where the fight would take place, we're supposed to believe that growing concerns led the Fury people to move the fight away from Saudi Arabia over to Tyson Fury's neck of the woods. But you tell me when have the Saudis ever failed to deliver? When? When have they ever failed to deliver on a deadline? When? They met the deadline when it came to the Joshua versus Ruiz rematch. I mean, we have seen them do this before. We have seen them host fights over there. Moreover, the fight is worth a lot more money in Saudi Arabia than it is at Wembley. But all of a sudden, when Tyson Fury's involved, we're supposed to believe that the Saudis can't deliver. Yeah, right. I don't actually buy into that cover story. I have no reason to believe that the Saudis could not deliver on a deadline. I'd sooner believe that this is just an out, an excuse, to take the fight from Saudi over to Wembley that favors Tyson Fury more than it favors Oleksandr Yusik because Saudi is a neutral location, whereas Wembley... Wembley is not. Wembley is Fury's neck of the woods. On top of having a height advantage, a reach advantage, and a weight advantage, he also wants home field advantage. Chicken shit. Tack on the deal structure. I've said it many times before, and I'll say it here again. What the Saudis were likely offering for the fight was for the rights to it in order to auction off those rights to the highest bidder. Like they did with Joshua versus Yusuf too. The problem with that is, if you sell the Saudis the rights to the fight, it may end up on a competing platform in the United Kingdom, in the United States. If you sell them those rights, the rights to the fight might get bought by Sky Sports or by DAZN, and the same applies here in America. If you sell the Saudis those rights, the fight might get bought by DAZN. Frank and Bob wouldn't like that. They want the rights to the fight to go to their broadcast partners, their platforms, BT and ESPN, even if it means splitting a smaller pot, a substantially smaller pot. As you can imagine, the Usyk people aren't going to like this because they stood to make a lot of money over there in Saudi Arabia. Now they stand to make less in fury. He's going to want the lion's share. Late last month, Bob Arum confirmed that the Usyk people were satisfied with the deal offered to them by the Saudis, and it was Fury. For whatever reason, his deal wasn't done yet. And now Oleksandr Usyk is expected to accept a deal for a lot less money than he was supposed to make, even though he already accepted his deal from the Saudis. He's supposed to just bend over for Tyson Fury. Concede to not only giving him home field advantage, but the lion's share of the pot as well, even though his deal with the Saudis was situated, and they were just waiting on Fury. They're using this whole bit about the stadium to cover up the fact they want to give Fury every advantage. On top of ensuring that their broadcast partners get the rights to the fight and not someone else as a result of selling them to the Saudis. They're sure
shortchanging Alexander Yusik is what they're doing. The fight fan in me is still hoping that this fight can be salvaged, even though there's reason enough to believe it's in jeopardy. Krasiuk wants a 50-50 split. Even if the fight ends up at Wembley, they're saying they're not gonna budge. They want a 50-50 split. Could be a problem. Even if you yourself out there think that Tyson Fury at Wembley is the A-side fighter to Oleksandr Yusik, don't forget what this is costing Oleksandr Yusik. They were satisfied with their deal from the Saudis. You moving this thing to Wembley is costing him a lot of money on the premise that you don't think the Saudis could have built the stadium in time when have they ever not delivered on a deadline? It's bullshit. And even if, by some chance, for argument's sake, they required a little more time to get the stadium done, you know, I'll be your huckleberry, I'll play devil's advocate, let's say it's exactly the way you say it is, and the Saudis would have needed a little bit more time for the amount of money that they were willing to put up for this fight, surely you could have given them a little bit more time. For the amount of money that these people were willing to pay to both of you guys, you couldn't give them more time? It's bullshit. Not that I buy into this stadium cover story, the stadium mumbo jumbo, because I don't. It's bullshit. Now we have to hope that these guys can reach a deal, because if they don't, the fight will fall apart, and we as the boxing fans will once again be robbed of an undisputed heavyweight title fight. That's the situation. They don't reach a deal. Oleksandr yusik has got one or two mandatory challenges in the queue. He's gonna have to satisfy them. Daniel Dubois is one among them. The winner of Joyce versus Zhang would be another. And don't forget Philippe Pergovic by way of the IBF. Fury people will try to frame it as if it's Oleksandr Yusik's fault when what you essentially did was you moved the fight and it costed him a lot of money that he would have made and you don't want to compensate him for it. If this fight falls apart, that's essentially what went down. That's essentially what happened because Fury's own promoter stated that Usyk agreed to his end of the deal. They were waiting on Luke. They were waiting on Tyson Fury. Don't tell me that the deal structure was no good. The deal structure was good enough for Eddie Hearn to make Joshua versus Usyk there, so why isn't it good enough to make Fury versus Yusik there. Because Fury's a chicken shit. He can call Alexander Yusik a middleweight till he's blue in the face. You're still the chicken shit that needs home field advantage to feel comfortable enough to box that middleweight. Do you think it's a coincidence that Daniel Dubois in his last fight fought a cruiserweight who was also a southpaw? Do you think it's a coincidence that Joe Joyce is also fighting a southpaw just like Usyk is a southpaw in his next fight? Do you think those are coincidences? I think Frank is getting those guys ready for for if and when this deal falls apart, because it might. Those are Usyk's mandatory challenges, and both of those guys happen to be Frank Warren fighters. Is that a coincidence? That Daniel fought a southpaw, and Joe is fighting one next. You can't trust Tyson Fury, he's a pathological liar. And you can't trust Frank Warren either. And finally, in men's light flyweight news, on the undercard of former kickboxer turnt boxer Tenshin Natsukawa's professional boxing debut, reigning unified... Ain't that the same Tenshin Natsukawa that Floyd Mayweather slapped up in that exhibition match? One and the same. Hard to call it an exhibition match, it being that Floyd knocked the kid out, but that's the same Tenshin Natsukawa he shared the ring with, and he now has his professional boxing license, and he's going to be making his professional boxing debut in April, on the 8th. Via Amazon Prime. But that's hardly the fight, hardly the fighter on this card that has my attention. It's actually Kenshiro Taraji versus Bomba Gonzalez. It's their unification match that has my attention. A couple of decent fights on there, you know. Now, yeah, you know his brother, Takuma Inui, he's gonna be taking on Labario Solis, Kiko Martinez. What the hell's he doing there? The light flyweight unification match, the light flyweight contest of champions between unified champion Kenshiro Taraji and Bomba Gonzalez, that's the fight that has my attention because the winner of the fight, whoever it is, will be a shoo-in to crack the ring IQ pound for pound list. There are a couple of situations. There's a couple of things you want to keep an eye on. Vacancies on the list that may open up. For starters, four division champion of Japan, Kazuto Ioka, was recently ordered by the WBO to satisfy his mandatory challenger in his countryman, Junto Nakatani, former WBO flyweight champion Junto Nakatani, who has since moved up to super flyweight. He's Kazuto mandatory and if Kazuto don't fight him the title is forfeit a deal has not yet been reached and a purse bid will be ordered on the 23rd if Kazuto vacates his title if he don't fight this guy he's off the list per the rules that govern it no fighter absent of a world title is allowed to maintain a rank on the ring IQ pound for pound list as the list is only for winners and only for champions you need to be a champion just to be considered 
much less rank. You need to be in possession of an alphabet title that you successfully defend. And if you vacate that title, if you forfeit that title to your mandatory challenger, you're off the list. Four division champion Kazuto Ioka is coming dangerously close to being bumped off the list. He don't reach a deal with this guy, and he don't fight this guy. If he decides to chuck the title in the air and go elsewhere, he's off the list. He's out. We'll lose that number five spot. That's a situation that you want to keep an eye on. Yet another situation that you want to keep an eye on is the upcoming Tosh Jailer versus Teofimio Lopez fight, a fight that I believe is set to go down sometime in May. Josh was supposed to be fighting Jack again, but he got injured, and it turned into fighting Jack again to fighting Teofimo Lopez. But Josh Taylor, you know, he really hasn't been looking like the same guy that saw himself become this division's undisputed champion. He gave up most of the alphabet titles that he was in possession of. He's not very active these days. By the time he does fight Teofimo Lopez, it will have been over a year's time since the man had a fight. By the time that he does fight Teofimo Lopez, the fight between Kenshiro Taraji and Bomba Gonzalez will have already taken place. The winner of that fight will be a unified champion in possession of three of the four alphabet titles in the men's light flyweight division, whereas Josh... Josh gave up most of his belts. He's not undisputed anymore. He's not even unified. Taraji versus Gonzalez is set to go down in April, whereas Taylor versus Lopez, I think that's set to go down in May. Josh Taylor, that's not a guy you see on most pound for pound lists these days. And currently on the Ring IQ pound for pound list, he ranks in at number 10. He's already in the most danger of being bumped off. He's lost a lot of ground over time. And I think that I have given this fighter, this champion, about as much consideration as I can give him in good conscience. The winner of the fight, fight. the winner of the Taraji versus Gonzalez fight, particularly if the winner of the fight is Kenshiro Taraji. Based on what he did to Hiroto Kayaguchi last year when he took his belt, and what he might do to Bomba Gonzalez. What he might do to that guy, that champion, if he takes his belt, he'll be a shoe in to crack the ring IQ pound for pound list. And Josh, unfortunately, he's gonna get bumped off. That's the way it's looking. Looks like there could be two vacancies on the ring IQ pound for pound list in the very near future. If Kazuto Ioka vacates his WBO title, he's out of that number five spot. And if the winner of Taraji versus Gonzalez ends up being Kenshiro Taraji, he's a shoe in to crack the list. He really is. This Josh Taylor's not done enough in the last 12 months or so to maintain a rank. He's not active enough. He's not in possession of all the alphabet titles anymore. He's only got one. His last performance. Most people, myself included, don't think he actually beat Jack Catterall. In the eyes of many, he lost that fight. This looks to be the last stand of Tosh Jailer oh. on the ring IQ pound for pound list. As Taraji versus Gonzalez is set to go down the month before what's supposed to be Taylor versus Lopez. It is what it is.